In the name of God, the Holy, the Merciful, His Majesty King Abdullah II bin Al Hussein, Her Majesty Queen Rania Al Abdullah, Your Majesty Crown Prince, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Dear guests of Jordan. Good morning. I am extremely honored and pleased uh, to meet you today in the Dead Sea for the tenth time to participate to this World Economic Forum for the Middle East and North Africa. And allow me to mention in the beginning that the sustainability of this event in this location during the past decade is a great proof that Jordan became the destination of friends and colleagues coming from around the globe to discuss together the major problems and challenges that our world is facing today and to discuss the relevant solutions. This will take us to highlight the specificities of the Kingdom uh, of uh, Jordan. Why is this Kingdom uh, the place attracting such events. This is pushing us to raise the following questions. How come this country is stable on the peace and security level for the past century, although it is located in a region that suffered from a lot of conflicts uh, to which was added many obstacles due to the Arab Spring. How was this country able to achieve this uh, development on the level of infrastructure, economy, services? And how was it able to overcome economic obstacles and to achieve economic growth in the most sensitive situations? How was this country able to uh, protect the values of uh, co-citizenship uh, and peace uh, amongst its people and to welcome thousands of uh, refugees who came here seeking peace and protection. This is something that is pushing many persons to raise questions about the reason behind the success of this experience. This safe and stable country is benefiting uh, since its establishment from a wise authority that led to the development uh, of all these values and led to the development of the uh, code of ethics and values uh, that oriented us. In fact, the people of Jordan, with its authority, had centuries of good positive relationships governed by the best interest of the kingdom and by values that all relevant parties are committed to. If we want to summarize this whole topic, we would say that Jordan excelled during its history in changing uh, challenges into opportunities and in investing in sensitive uh, times uh, as per an ethical 
code of conduct, pinpointing the fact that the Jordanian citizen is the added value of this country. And today, when we read the main titles of this World Economic Forum, be it the fourth industrial revolution, entrepreneurship, environment challenges, climate change, or international peace and justice, we understand why Jordan was the destination for all of us, and we understand why Jordan is part of the solution, be it on the regional level or the international level. Here we are gathered today before the beginning of our second millennium, paving the way for economic development and prosperity based on the rule of law and the complementarity of economic uh, development and social development. All uh, those axes uh, evolve around uh, the life of uh, our citizens. Therefore, we are adopting procedures that are continuously assessed as per the system of quality and efficiency, and therefore our concentration is focusing, uh, as uh, His uh, Majesty uh, King Abdullah Tu bin Hussein said, on economic development and its impact uh, on the youth and on the labor market. Uh, we have uh, adopted uh, a growth uh, strategy that focuses on short, uh, medium, and long-term uh, uh, objectives, and we are trying to uh, enhance uh, the um, livelihoods uh, of uh, Jordanian citizens uh, in order to ensure uh, a good quality services, uh, be it on the level of the services, infrastructure, uh, uh, health, uh, or other sectors. Uh, our added value is represented by the youth, uh, the youth uh, benefiting from the education, the skills, and the competencies uh, needed. In fact, more than 23 percent of the entrepreneurs in the region are Jordanian. In spite of the fact uh, that Jordan represents 3% uh, of the population in the MENA region only, let us not forget the capacity of Jordan to export uh, high-quality services towards uh, several countries in uh, the MENA region and uh, around the world. We are also convinced uh, that uh, the road leading to sustainable economic development uh, should uh, uh, require uh, an increase in uh, uh, Jordanian, uh, uh, Arab, and international uh, investments. Uh, in fact, we have uh, a great uh, strategic location uh, in addition to many trade agreements uh, allowing us to export our goods uh, towards uh, Europe, uh, the United States, uh, Africa, and the Middle East. In addition to that, we look forward forward uh, to uh, play uh, a pivotal role in reconstructing uh, the countries of the region. Uh, the indicators uh, are all positive. In fact, our exports uh, increased uh, by 13.6 uh, uh, percent uh, during uh, the month uh, of uh, December compared to the same month in 2018. And uh, the number of uh, societies increased by 34 percent during the first quarter of the current year compared to the same duration in 2018. The uh, number of uh, 
register trademarks uh, also increased during the first quarter of the current year uh, by 24 percent compared to the same duration in the previous year. All these indicators prove that we are walking in uh, the good uh, direction, and this will uh, uh, allow us uh, to invite all our uh, colleagues uh, uh, from uh, the region to invest uh, in Jordan. Uh, we are gathered uh, today in the Dead Sea, this exceptional uh, touristic hub. Allow me to uh, pinpoint uh, the touristic uh, uh, places in Jordan, uh, Petra, uh, Ajloun, and other uh, um, regions uh, benefiting uh, from this cultural and religious heritage. Uh, many of those uh, touristic uh, places uh, are listed on the international touristic map, uh, which is, again, a great great uh, uh, motivation uh, for additional investment. Uh, and we are convinced that uh, the future uh, will be bright and that we will reap uh, the fruits uh, of this hope. Uh, and hopefully today you will be uh, listening to additional details about uh, opportunities uh, that uh, Jordan benefits uh, from. And we are looking forward to hearing uh, from you in order to reinforce uh, this uh, long-term uh, partnership uh, between us. Allow me again to welcome you and uh, to wish uh, that uh, this uh, World Economic Forum uh, will be uh, beneficial for all of us uh, in the service of our present and in the service of the future uh, of our young generations. Peace be upon you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for that very inspiring message. We're now in for a very special treat. We're going to take a journey through Jordan, a very special journey. We're going to see Jordan through the eyes of some very talented young Jordanians who come from a Montessori school and are trained by Lara Atala. Please give them a warm welcome.
<laughs> your Majesties, your Royal Highnesses, your Excellencies, distinguished guests. My name is Zina and I'm 14 years old. Hello, bonjour, hola, ni hao, marhaba. How is everyone doing today? My name is Fadi and I'm 13 years old and we are from Petra. And today we are going through a journey to Jordan and its wonderful cities. But first, may I ask, who here is a parent? Thank you for being parents, because everything you do for us shapes us and the future of the world. I love watching my father at work and love hearing his stories. When I grow up, I want to be just like him. And who knows, maybe even better. We are ready to show you all this beautiful country we call home. Yes, it may seem small on the map, but it is huge in surprises. We invite you all to join us on an adventure to show you Jordan through our eyes. Petra, as you may know, is also called the Red Rose City because it is carved out of multicolored rock. These rocks are mostly pink with swirls of brown, red, and purple. An artistic masterpiece of nature. The treasury, the monastery tombs, the Nabataean amphitheater, and cave dwellings are all carved out of these rocks. Can you imagine that the Nabataeans did all that without using today's tools nor electricity? Wow. Petra was chosen as one of the new wonders of the world in 2007, where a hundred million people voted. A hundred million people? Yeah. A hundred million people from all over the world voted for us? Yeah. I'm so honored. So am I. More than 2,000 years ago, Petra was a really important place because of its location at crossroads between north and south and east and west. Petra was an extremely wealthy capital for the Nabataeans, especially due to its trade routes and products. We, as the modern descendants of the Nabataeans, welcome you with open arms and would love to show you our way of life, from our traditional dress, food, culture, such as the proper way to wear a shmach. I'm always showing tourists how to put on a shmach. Imagine transforming Petra from a place you visit to, to something you experience. Imagine working together to bring back Petra to what it once was. Or even better, a haven for sharing ideas and a melting pot for a variety of cultures. And now, we come to our next destination, the amazing Wadi Rum. Did you know that millions of years ago, all of this was under the sea? What? The big mountains as well? Yes, they were all made underwater. That's why they look so weird and cool. Valley of the Moon. I camped in Wadi Rum with my father once. There was no light at all, just the light from the moon and the beautiful stars. I usually never stop talking, but the silence was just too beautiful to disrupt. I remember laying down there and looking up at the stars and realizing how big the universe is. The desert is so vast as well. I mean, the dunes, the huge mountains, it's so much fun there. I met these people once where they spent weeks hiking and riding horses. All this talking is making me hungry. Zarb. Oh, yummy. I really enjoy how the Bedouins prepare the zarb. Under the sand, the meat and vegetables just melt in your mouth. It tastes so good. It's so interesting how they do it. From digging the pit, to placing the food under the sand, to taking it out, ready to be devoured. And then sitting under the stars by the campfire, singing songs and drinking tea. That's something you really can't miss. I also remember seeing tiny climbers on those big mountains way up high and people riding air balloons and tiny planes. There's just so much to do. Okay, Fadi, now you're getting too excited. Did you know that Aqaba is only one hour away? There you can enjoy more sand at the Red Sea. There's just so much to do in Aqaba. Swimming, diving, or just simply relaxing by the sea. Even shopping. My mother says that Aqaba is duty free. There's a lot of fun activities to do, like jet skiing, 
wakeboarding, snorkeling, and even banana boat. Can't forget that beautiful coral reef. I've met people from all over the world who come to dive in Aqaba. Although our coastline is small, there are so many different dive sites, ranging from shallow coral gardens to deep canyons and shipwrecks. There is even a plane you can swim through. And now we come to the lowest point on Earth, the Dead Sea. Did you know that the Dead Sea is 400 meters below sea level? But the most amazing thing is floating on the sea. And the mud? The mud is amazing for your skin. People come from all over the world for the mud. Yes, it is located on the lowest point on Earth and has the highest levels of oxygen, which does wonders for your health. It has incredible healing powers. That's because it's one of the saltiest bodies of water on Earth. It's literally the largest natural spa in the world. The Dead Sea is our hidden secret to perfect skin. You get it? Secret? Oh, Fadi. Imagine a whole skincare city built in this magical place. Our journey continues from deserts to forests, from sand to trees, from hot to fresh breezes. We enter Jarash. I would like to be the Roman governor of that awesome city, Jarash. Yes, I love the colonnaded streets and the temples and the history. It's just so nice. They have beautiful hippodromes, like cool, cool Roman chariot shows, Roman soldier marches, and even gladiator shows. They have, they have so much festivals. I once watched Placido Domingo singing in a 1,500-year-old amphitheater in the open air. It was just so majestic. Jarash is another crossroad between trade and culture. Adam Smith said that trade and commerce is the best way to peace. Speaking of peace, we are also the regional makers and exporters of peace, which brings us to our next destination, where peace and harmony are instilled within us. Religion. The baptism site. There are 34 Christian sites in Jordan, which have been mentioned in both the Old and the New Testaments. We are blessed to have the history of two main religions, to have the same chance to walk the same path as Jesus and Moses. Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist in Jordan, where the roots of Christianity began, Bethany beyond the Jordan. The early pilgrims used the Bethany area as a route between Mount Nebo and Jerusalem via the Jordan River. The site was inscribed in the World Heritage List in July 2015. It belongs to you all. We are the custodians and we are proud to say that it has been preserved the way Jesus and John saw. Therefore, we are blessed to have the same chance to experience the wilderness of John the Baptist and the biblical stories in their original setting. Whatever we say about the baptism site will never be enough. One thing is for sure though, to genuinely experience the spirituality of this unique site, you have to visit it. A site of such great importance needs to receive the proper care and attention it deserves. Imagine a village hosting people from all over the world under the umbrella of love and spirituality. And now we come to our final destination, the beautiful Amman the heart of the thriving nation. A representation of all the diversity in Jordan, in one city, one large city with four million surrounding neighborhoods. Haman grew from a village to a city with a sense of friendliness still embedded in those who live in it. Opportunities that still thrive and blossom. I met a friend once and she told me that you can make it big in this city. You can be someone. You can make an impact, she said. I want to be a doctor because the doctors of Amman are all well-educated, well-prepared. They work in super hospitals with all types of futuristic equipment. My dad says that we are the leaders in the region in many medical fields. I want to be a businesswoman. I keep seeing all these CEOs who are women, women like me, leading large companies like telecommunications, medical, and even governmental. 
There's so much to do. But for now, let's keep on learning and dreaming until we figure it out and go to university. Or I can work in the movies. There's, there is a Royal Film Commission that connects local talents with both local and international productions. Yes, many movies were filmed here. Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Last Day on Mars. Transformers. Mission to Mars. Star Wars. The Hurt Locker. And many more. Also, the upcoming movie of Aladdin. And hopefully, way more to come. Imagine building the first state-of-the-art facility here in Jordan with different studios. Jordan and the Jordanians have so much to offer. Yes. We are the gateway to the world and we are ready. This is the connector of worlds, where West meets East, where North meets South. This is where we should all meet, have our exhibitions, our, our cross-cultural weddings, our sessions, our training workshops. This is Jordan. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it has been an honor to have you with us on such an amazing journey through our country. And we hope that you not only hear what we have to offer as a country and go experience it all yourselves. I assure you, it will be an experience like no other. We are the leaders of tomorrow. Your actions will define our future. We will continue paving the path you are paving for us now, bestowed on you by your parents. We are the leaders of tomorrow and for a better future. For the future.
I'd, I'd like to begin with uh, Royal Highness Princess Reem Ali, a member of the film industry's, uh, member of the board of the Royal Film Commission. So the film industry seems to have discovered Jordan as a fantastic movie set. And uh, there are currently many, there's currently films in production, other ones on the, on the horizon. But I'm wondering if the current production facilities are adequate, uh, whether there's trained personnel, uh, whether you're fully exploring the potential for developing a Jordanian tourism that will also train members of the communities who live near the film sites. Absolutely, thank you so much, Ani, and um, thank you all for being here, Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, uh, Your Royal Highness. Um, so I'll just go very quickly to answer your question, but I'd just like to give an overview of what uh, tour film tourism in Jordan is really about. Um, so we're going, we're going to be talking briefly about the economic impact of productions, that's film and TV, why Jordan is the ideal place for productions, and that will include an answer to your question about crews, uh, skills, and how it works with the local communities, um, and film tourism as an opportunity for growth. And I might add at the outset that none of this really would be um, possible without the enabling environment that has been created by His Majesty for, for all this to really thrive and take place in our country. Um, for 10 years, the past 10 years, the uh, foreign and local film productions, just to give a rough figure, have spent uh, over an estimated $335 million and created 95,000 job opportunities in Jordan. And we're hoping that we will see more of that in the future. What Jordan offers is, of course, the unique and diverse locations that you've been seeing in the pictures. Uh, if anybody have see, has seen the film A Private War with Rosamund Pike, uh, that was actually filmed almost entirely in Jordan, including scenes uh, where Jordan was doubling as Sri Lanka. So that gives you an idea of the diversity of the landscapes that we have here. There's historical and religious sites. Indiana Jones, as you've seen, was uh, shot in Petra. Uh, the safe and secure environment is extremely important, and the skilled local crew. Now, that's an answer directly to your question, which the Royal Film Commission, uh, since its uh, creation by uh, my husband, Prince Ali, 16 years ago, has been steadily growing. We train uh, local crew. We use opportunities uh, offered by productions that come in as well to continue that training and further that training. And we offer all sorts of workshops within the Royal Film Commission not only within Amman, but also in all the governorates where we have film centers that offer these um, opportunities for um, anyone who's interested to really learn, and then they're able to work on films that come and shoot on location. Uh, and we've had a lot of success. Uh, local communities actually asking us to keep going, to continue these programs, to really provide uh, what we can to facilitate films because they're benefiting so much from that. Uh, there's a diversity of people also that's very important when it comes to casting, for example. English is widely spoken, as I'm sure you all, know, you all know, and we have wide support from the government, especially from the Ministry of Tourism, the Georgian Tourism Board, and support from the army. Uh, thanks to the Royal Film Commission, uh, in addition to that, there's easy administrative procedures. It's a one-stop shop. There's wide experience in supporting productions, so anybody who needs to go scouting, anybody who needs film permits can come and do that through the Royal Film Commission. Um, and finally, there are financial incentives, which are actually probably the most important uh, thing. And I'd like to announce something here. Uh, so far, eligible productions uh, can benefit from 10% to 20% of a cash rebate, and they can also benefit from sales tax and customs um, uh, duties exemptions. Now, uh, the finance ministry has currently doubled these incentives in the budget, which allows us to extend our rebate program to more films and increase the ceiling to e for each production. And that will help us compete with the region in terms of uh, attracting film productions. Um, so I'm not going to continue. I think you need me to <laughs> uh, wrap up. Uh, just to say that really this also provides, of course, excellent advertising opportunities for Jordan because you have so many tourists that will come. And I'd just like to flag, apart from the films that have been mentioned, mainly Aladdin that's going to be launched on the big screens on the 24th of May and Star Wars later on this year. Uh, all these, like The Martian, will provide ample advertising opportunities, hopefully, for the country. Thank you. Thank you, Royal House.
My next question is for Shannon Stoll. He's the founder and CEO of the Adventure Travel Trade Association. And your organization has been really at the forefront of bringing adventure tourism and adventure travel to Jordan. But adventure travelers also have the potential to venture into fragile areas in the wilderness and in numbers that could be detrimental to the environment. So what can your organization, the government, businesses do to prevent this from happening? Sure, thank you, Arnie. And thank you, your excellencies and delegates for this honor to be here today. In our sector of the travel space, we've talked a lot about how adventure travel sits at the intersection of commerce, community, and conservation. And that's why it felt like such a good match today for the World Economic Forum, which is committed to improving the state of the world. Our industry really works on the mission and belief that we can do business without sacrificing the environment or local people's involvement. So when you think about adventure travel, you might be tempted to immediately go to very extreme images in your mind, and, and it's, that's a fair assessment in some cases. Skydiving, ice climbing, maybe uh, wild animal wrestling. But the, the actual data shows that consumers think of adventure travel is containing three things, nature, culture, and physical activity. So sometimes it's very accessible. Jordan clearly is a perfect match with its deep cultural opportunities and offerings, and also with the ab abundant nature as well. So why this market matters is in the last decade it's exploded. As tourism has grown at 5% a year, adventure travel since 2012 has grown at 20% year over year which represents opportunities and some threats to fragile places, which I'll come to. We've actually been in Jordan for the last three years, so we have kind of a case study on uh, what is essentially a pilot. We've done three tourism trade events focused on adventure travel, two at the Dead Sea, one in Aqaba, and we are measuring the results of that. And what's coming out of it is very interesting. So USAID did a study here in Jordan in the last two years and found that General tourism in general, or often called mass tourism, will tend to leave about 15% of the revenue that the customer spends in the destination. Now, adventure travel leaves 65%. So although it's a much smaller sector, it is incredibly potent in its economic opportunity. So this is something that is really interesting when we look at climate change and over-tourism, and I agree with the Secretary General of the UN that climate change is, is staring us in the face. In fact, Yvonne Chouinard just pulled all of his funding from polar bear uh, preservation because he said it's too late, they're gone. They're on their way out. So we're facing not stuff far in the future, but stuff that's right around the corner. In regards to um, what can we do to prevent damage today, I think the answer is multifold. Certainly, training and education, and uh, USAID, our organization, the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, and other bodies within Jordan are working. We've trained guides. We're training trainers so it can propagate best practices throughout the the country. And then also, there's the opportunity for um, for more strategies. For example, Peru right now is looking at how do we take travelers anywhere but Machu Picchu? Can, can tour operators sell Peru without Machu Picchu? And the answer is yes. So we're looking at very interesting uh, ways to move along there. Um, finally, I think the tourists that come uh, tend to be sensitive. As, as the saying goes in India, eyes on the tiger mean the tiger is safe. It means good managed tourism is gonna protect tourism. So with that, I would just say as, as Jordan and as other countries look at developing your tourism, I would say look at values and value, not volume. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Arnie. Thank you. My next question is... My next question is for Rustam Mikjan, Acting Director General of the Baptism Site. So Jordan's religious sites are, are extraordinary. Uh, if a visitor had only a week, six days, to explore Jordan's holy sites, how would you recommend they spend their time? Well, uh, to start with, I think we're blessed to be present right here, where within a radius of around 25 kilometers only, we've got four gems. Gems that are there for everybody to enjoy. 
The baptism site is not far away from here. It's the land of prophets. It's where Elijah was taken up to heaven. John came and lived in a simple cave, preparing the way for the Lord. And eventually John met Jesus and baptized him. And that's where Christianity physically started. So therefore, it's a very important site. It's, I always say, probably a lot of people have said Jordan or the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. But let me add that the baptism site at the place where the Lord was baptized, that's the lowest archaeological discovery on earth, but it's closest to heaven. So basically, Jordan is heaven on earth. Uh, whatever I talk, the baptism site is my baby, but I need to go to else, other places, to other sites of great importance to mankind. That Mount Nebo would be another one where Moses had his final look to the Jordan Valley, Gilad, and the Holy Land. But then, we move on to Madaba. Madaba is definitely one of the most famous cities on earth, mosaic cities that is. And it, at the end of the 19th century, the most precious mosaic map was discovered. The mosaic map of the Holy Land, which includes 156 sites that are mentioned in the Bible. We are honored in Jordan, as the kids have just shown us, that we have 34 of them at least present in Jordan. What we need to do is to invest in these sites, make our pilgrims arrive to Jordan because it's a safe place, enjoy and walk in the trails of the prophets. But then we move on to another site of great importance, Macarius or Macaur, where John was beheaded. So John started his life preparing the way of the Lord in a simple cave but was beheaded in Macarius because Herod the Tetrarch, the king of the Perea, had married his brother's wife, and according to Matthew chapter 14, eventually when Salome danced the famous dance, John was beheaded. So I believe, personally, that at least two or three days are needed to concentrate on the central parts of Jordan, but then let's not forget, not only do we have important Decapolis cities of the Roman period, but let's remember that a lot of them are very uh, well noted in the Bible. Among them, Gadara, where the first miracle of Jesus took place east of the Jordan, having crossed the Tiberias, the Galilee. And then we have Pella. Refugees have been mentioned in Jordan. That we, do we know that the first century, early Christians took refuge in Pella? So therefore, these are great points to concentrate upon. Let's not forget the birthplace of Elijah. Elijah, the Tishbite, is born near Ajlon, the northern parts of Jordan. That's another gem. Elijah was born in Jordan and was taken up to heaven in chariot and horse fire east of the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now, then we can move on to Rahab and elsewhere. So even two days could be spent in the northern parts of Jordan. And then we would go to the, following the uh, King's Highway, if you wish, we'd be able to arrive to, uh, um, sorry, Petra, Aaron Shrine, and then arrive to the lowest Museum on Earth, Lot's Cave. We might even have Sodom and Gomorrah because the Holy Quran is very sure saying that the remains are there and it we know is east of the Jordan, east of in the borders of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. So whatever I say, Your Majesties, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, is that Jordan is the place of the Amman message, common word, Interfaith harmony, moreover, it's the place to build bridges of love and peace between mankind. So we'd love to have you here to not only enjoy these sites, but walk in the trails of the prophets we all respect. Rustam, I, I love your, your passion and enthusiasm. Uh, Annie Hood is the chief executive and founder of Well Intelligence and an authority on well-being tourism. So Annie, well-being and tourism has moved far beyond the spa and the spa experience. So what are some of the unique attributes of Jordan that it has to offer in wellness tourism? Thank you, Arnie, and delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, before I move into what I think is the three key foundational pillars for Jordan's position to win in well-being tourism, let me just give you a little window on the world in terms of where that sits. Um, well-being tourism is valued at 639 billion globally. 
Um, it's the fastest growing um, tourism sector. And in the MENA region, um, we had 11 million visitors to this region in 2017. And that was an uplift from 8.5 million in 2015, the value of 10.7 billion. So it's growing um, fast, which is fantastic. What is also fantastic is that it's just tipping into mainstream. It used to be seen as quite niche, um, but now it's something that is incorporated into all travel. It isn't just about primary travel in well-being. And what I mean by that is a immersive program, um, a retreat that you might go to for seven days, 14 days, even a month. Well-being is something that everybody wants want when they travel. And what that means is it's no longer an option to include. It cannot be ignored. So um, the three key pillars um, for, uh, for Jordan, the first I think is hard science and the fabulous children gave me a lovely platform to launch into this. And uh, where we are now at the Dead Sea, your oxygen levels, the clinical proof of being here from a healing perspective are second to none. And, but that's not just about medical, it's also about well-being and how people feel. Those oxygen levels really promote and help sleep, the quality of sleep, which is incredibly important. And um, I think from that perspective, that evidenced brand of Jordanian well-being will be one of your cornerstones. Number two, spiritual resonance and digital detox. Um, as we all know, um, technology has almost taken over our lives, but people want to escape from that. And as my, my colleague to, to, to my right was, was, was just talking about, the, the uh, religious and also the spiritual profundity of this country is immense. You know, people want to be a part of that. And what you have is something that can be synonymous with inner peace, with self-actualization, so being here in Jordan can be a central point to that. Number three, spotlighting integrity and consciousness. The humanitarianism that Jordan epitomizes should not be underestimated. And if I may, if you remember one thing from what I'm saying today, it is this. Emotional connection is the currency of wellness travel today, and Jordan has that in absolute abundance. Travelers want to be connecting with a country that connects at a local human level and they want to be a part of that halo of strong human values. So the Jordanian well-being trifecta, if I can call it that, is hard science, spiritual resonance and digital detox, and integrity and consciousness spotlight. Thank you so much, Annie. <laughs> Nadim Mu Ashar is an investor in the tourism section and sector of Jordan. Uh, Nadim, the tourism sector, Petra is the single most visited site. And you're working on a project that brings it and Wadi Musa, the whole region, to life in, in, a, in greater scale <coughs> with greater historical perspective. Can you sum up its potential economic impact in terms of both growth of visitors and contribution to nearby communities? Thank you, Arnie. Uh, the reality is Petra is one of the kingdoms that have developed in, in, the, in the region and have passed on its civilization to the, to the country of Jordan and the region. And the Nabataeans have had a major role in developing the city of Petra as, as, it is, as it stands today and understood today. But unfortunately, we only see the treasury in Petra. That's what we relate to. The reality is there is a big culture behind Petra that needs to be understood as well, because it is a very attractive and interesting culture that we should focus on and try to bring about uh, in the community that lives around there. So <clears throat> there is the Petra section, which is the heritage that we have. But there is the Wadi Musa part, which is a very important part of that realm of tourism in that sector. How can we make projects that are inclusive, uh, inclu that creates inclusion for the community, that brings prosperity to them as much as it brings prosperity to the investors? How do we bridge the gap between the communities 
through our touristic sites. It's very important for us to remember that tourism thrives on the human integration and it also thrives on the understanding of culture, of each other. And finally, it all happens in a very joyful and happy mood. It's in a happy platform, and that's the time to reach out to people and really uh, try to connect to them as, as, as well as we can. One of the steps that I would like to, if time allows me, because we are time down. Please Thank continue. You. All right. The, the most important part for us is to see how we can get the country to work as a whole. The youth in the country will be the engine that will drive these sites. We are not giving them a chance enough to come into play in the process of planning for these cities. And I think it's very important to use the academic base, which forms almost a third of the population, the academic base, the students, to be part of that developmental platform. And this can happen by getting students from universities who are studying the arts and the culture and to come in and do a term or a quarter in Petra or in Jarash, in the areas where there is that richness of heritage and, and engineering and art and etc. How can we bring them to be engaged in this and really de develop Wadi Musa to become the center of art, culture, and equestrianship. Hmm. This is a very important stage which we can do through the academia by improving our academics there for applied learning and bringing people to exhibit their artwork, do their artwork there, create a platform of big park in the wadi sides, not the wadi itself, on the sides of the wadi, to become the exhibition area, the, the, where people integrate between the students, the visitors, the community. And the benefit of the community from all of that is they will be the people who will create lodging for the students coming in. And if we start a system of creating digs for students, can you imagine the integration of Petra, the Wadi Musa, and the whole concept starts shaping up a lively Wadi Musa with the youth uh, exhibiting their artwork, doing their researches in certain areas of engineering and architecture because of the wealth of knowledge we have in the Nabatean Kingdom. They had the best water systems before anybody could, could uh, uh, do them. They actually invented the letters, the Arabic letters, and eventually the Arabic letters came from the Nabatean letters. This is a history that we, not all of us know. And I think it would be very important to try and make that inclusion uh, of the community plus inclusion of the students from all around Jordan. And this could apply to many sites in Jordan. So I hope we can drive towards this with full cooperation from the community and investors outside. Equestrianship is very important because we want to mo move and lift up the ha horse handlers to become Fursan el Petra, the Knights of Petra, who really do shows and do, uh, 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 you know, um, exhibition parades and uh, trails around around the region. So I think there is so much. I mean, one can sit and talk for hours about this, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just say we are we are getting you, the you're getting the message, yeah. and I'm trying to get people to just really engage through this. Yeah. So I hope I hope you will. You know, uh, I want to thank you first for for all this. And I'm sorry I took a little more time that's than I needed. That's okay, Nadim. Thank you. And thank you. I, th I think what the common thread here, which also ties in with what was came before, is uh, if there's one word, it is inclusiveness. It's inclusiveness of m the marriage of the visitors, the sites, the culture, the existing culture. And that blend gives Jordan, I believe, a unique place in the world. And I have seen many examples of people who want this to happen but don't have the resources. Jordan has those resources. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. We've, this concludes this session, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you.